in one way, shape, or form, we're all fighting a battle. So in that same spirit of praise and, and worship, let us remember who our victor is, who our champion is. Father, we come to you because you are our champion. Lord, when, when our battles seem like they have us won, when we feel defeated, Lord God, we understand that you are a powerful and good God, a God who fights our battles. The way we fight our battles is by letting you fight our battles, by surrendering to you in those moments, Lord God. Lord, we thank you. We thank you because we believe by faith that these battles that we face each and every day, you have won and you will get us to the other side of that battle. Father, we thank you. We cannot do this without you. Holy Spirit, we need you. We need you to empower us, to give us strength, to bring joy to our lives, Lord. Father, we thank you. We come to you because there is no other place, there is no other person that we can go to besides you. Father God, we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you guys. God bless you. Welcome, welcome, welcome. This is your first time at Expansion. Uh, there are several people that are not here because they told us they're, they're actually like in Spain and other parts of the country. So you'll see them over the next couple of weeks. Uh, but welcome, right? This is a, a, a venue that we like to, to have a little more intimacy. So it's not church as normal as you probably would experience church. This is more of a community family setting. That's why we have uh, 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 the, the decor of a living room, because we want you to feel like this is your home. Right. So get up, get some coffee, get some some snacks and then let's get into God's word today. Over the next two weeks, we're going to be talking about the Lord's Supper or communion or the Eucharist. Many names for this thing that we do as Christians. We're going to be talking about it over the next two weeks. Right. And next Sunday, I'm going to invite you back right now. I'm going to invite you back. And everybody else that's not here, make sure they come because we're going to share in communion. We're going to break bread and drink cup together, right? As communion. God, Jesus told us to do this in remembrance of him. And we do that as a family. We do that as community, right? So I invite you back next week to do this, to do this together as a community. And today we're going to talk about table manners right so if we're going to be at a table to drink cup and break bread and feast we got to talk about table manners what are the manners that we have to have at the lord's table right we're going to do that over the next couple of weeks today we're going to talk about this and we're going to see that in matthew chapter 26 today so i invite you all to join me in the book of Matthew, chapter 26, we're going to read 10 verses from verse 20 to 30. I invite you all to look it up on your phones, your smart devices, physical Bibles. We have some in the back if you need some. I like to hear the pages turn, right? <coughs> but if you don't have any of those things, we're going to put it on the screen for you. So make sure that we're all in attention to what God's word is telling us today. Right? So I'm going to ask you all who are physically able to stand and rise as we read God's word together. And when you all have it and have risen, say amen. Amen. All right. So Matthew 26, verse 20 says this. When it was evening, Jesus sat down at the table with the twelve. While they were eating, he said, I tell you the truth. One of you will betray me. Greatly distressed, each one asked in turn, am I the one? Am I the one? Am I the one? Twelve or eleven times. Lord, am I the one? He replied, one of you has just eaten from this bowl with me, will betray me. For the Son of Man must die, as the scriptures declared long ago, but 
how horrible it will be for that one who betrays him. It will be far better for that man if he had never been born. Judas, the one who would betray him, also asked, Rabbi, am I the one? And Jesus told him, you said it. As they were eating, Jesus took some bread and blessed it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take this and eat, for this is my body. And he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. He gave it to them and said, Each of you drink from it, for this is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice for the forgiveness of sins of many. Mark my words, I will not drink wine again until the day I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. Then they sang a hymn and went out to the Mount of Olives. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your word because through it, <coughs> you speak to us. Through your word, through the words and the, uh, uh, on these pages, Lord, you, have, you speak to our hearts and our minds. I ask, Lord, that, that we all here be at attention to what it is you have for us today. Lord, open our eyes and our ears spiritually as we read and listen to you, Father God. May these words seep into our hearts. May these words become reality in our lives. May we live them out. May they transform our lives and our family. Father God, here is your word and here are your people. Have your way with it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. you may be seated. <coughs> so during this month, what do we celebrate? Thanksgiving. 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 We celebrate Thanksgiving this month. Who's already prepared the turkey? Jolene? <laughs> <laughs> I know some people will start preparing it like this week, <laughs> nice and brined and seasoned, ready to go. We'll be there. <laughs> a couple days prior, right? We start preparing the trimmings. What do we, what do we prepare for the trimmings? Everything. Everything. Stuffing. There's no limit to the trimming. Right? <laughs> the stuffing, there's, what, 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 my favorite thing that you make? Oh my goodness, sweet potato pie with marshmallows on top. I know it's I know it's one o'clock. I know we're all hungry. I don't want to talk about food the whole time. But for the right, but for, for the Spanish people, we make the moto, we make the, the all the stuff that goes along with Thanksgiving. And then we go and we go buy clothes. Anybody buy clothes for a special attire for Thanksgiving? Right? You get I'm sure some of you females already have that already picked out. And you dress us, right? And then you dress the kids, and then we all look the same, right? <laughs> For that picture, right? We, we go to Saks Fifth Avenue. We go to Filene's, Filene's Basement, Sheen. <laughs> Aprons, right? I go to Walmart and Target. That's, you know, that's me. Uh, but we do all of these things because on that day, we're going to invite who? Our family, our friends. We're going to sit down around a table. We're going to sit down and eat a meal together. We're going to feast together. Right? And then when we sit down at this table, there are some manners. There are some manners we have to have at these tables that our grandmothers and mothers taught us. What are some of those manners? By the way, by expansion, in expansion here, this is not a one-way conversation. This is a two-way conversation. So what are some of those manners? Say hi to everyone in the house before anything. Say hi to everybody. Make sure you say hi and give a kiss in the cheek to everybody. You better, right? What else? Chew with your mouth closed. Chew with your mouth closed. My goodness, that's a big one, right? Prayer before meal. You must live in a Christian household. Yeah, prayer before meals. What else? Elbows off the table. Off the table. Why? Somebody explain that one to me. <laughs> <coughs> Somebody explain that to me. I teach that to my kids, and when they ask me why do we... Just do it. That's how I was taught. You're going to be taught that. Why do... We... What's the reason for the table? I don't know. I don't know. But elbows off the table. 
It's MF fail. Bad posture. Bad posture. Okay. So you got to sit up straight. No slouching. There was this. What's that? Be attentive. And if adults are talking, kids, Goodbye. do not interrupt. What's that? Afterward, right? <laughs> right. Save it for later. Save it for later. But <laughs> you like that one. <laughs> if adults are talking, kids, you better do not interrupt the adults, right? Or else. Right. And, and, and this is a new one that our grandmothers didn't teach us because they didn't have us. But what about these things? No devices. No devices off the table. Right. These are manners that were taught at a table. Right. During Thanksgiving, which is just a rehearsal of, if we're honest, for Christmas. Right. If we're honest, Thanksgiving is a rehearsal for Christmas. The big one. Right. <laughs> so in the same way, we have to have some manners when coming to the Lord's table. In the same way, we have to have some manners coming to the Lord's table. And that's what these two weeks are going to be about. What are some of those manners that we have to have as we break bread and drink cup together? Right? So we read today, this is one of the accounts of the Gospel of Matthew of the Lord's Supper. It is Thursday of Holy Week. Thursday of Holy Week. So we've already gone. Jesus has already entered into Jerusalem on Monday, has preached in Jerusalem these whole, all these days. And on Thursday of Holy Week, he tells his disciples, you guys go and go prepare a room for me. Go to the inn, go to a hotel, go to the restaurant nearby, and go set up the upper room to have the Lord's, to, to, to have, to celebrate communion, to celebrate the Passover, is really what was happening here. So he tells the disciples, go. Anybody been to a restaurant? Anybody forget their wallet? Right? <laughs> you, Right? You're not going to eat much if you forget your wallet. Right? <coughs> so it's safe to say, if Judas is the treasurer, who went to go pay for the room? Judas. Judas and the rest of them went to go purchase a room, the upper room, so they can have a feast together. And in this feast, this is they're celebrating the, the Jewish Passover. You guys know the story in Exodus? The Jewish Passover when... Uh, Moses and the people of Israel leave Egypt, right? Because of all the plagues that were happening that God brought on the Egyptian people. So they celebrate, the Jewish people since then have celebrated Passover as a celebration that God delivered them from Egypt. Right? You guys remember Passover, right? You guys remember that there was uh, uh, a death that came over the entire uh, land of Egypt, but you have to put... The, the blood of a lamb on, a, on your doorpost. And if you did that, it had death pass over you. Right? So they celebrate that way. So they brought a lamb to the Passover meals. That was part of the elements of Passover. They brought a lamb. Then there was blood on the doorpost. That blood represents the cup. So there was cups of wine that represented that blood. So there were four cups of wine and there was bread. Bread that represented the manna that as soon as they left Egypt, they, had, they were starving and God made it rain bread from heaven. So that manna, that matzah represented that. So they, they bought what's called matzah. It's unleavened bread. So there was unleavened bread. There was four cups of wine. There was a lamb that you would eat. And then there was like salad and bitters and things like that. There was this bowl that was in the center of the table with, uh, with, with vinegar and with oil and with salt. What does that sound like? Dip. Dressing, dip, right? <laughs> and so people would dip their lettuces or their bitters into that. But all of them would because it was one communal bowl. So the, 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 the Lord's table is set up. Jesus is sitting with his disciples one last time because what's going to happen on Friday? He's going to get tried, 
arrested, tried, crucified, right? That's what's going to happen on Friday. So you can imagine the pain and the anguish that Jesus is experiencing trying to relax and have a feast and have a meal with his people. So they're together. They're sitting down. The Bible says that, and we read, that they sat together on, on, a, on, a, on a table that's, you see it in, in, in the pictures, right? In, in, the, in the, the Da Vinci art that was there, but that's not really the picture that you should be looking at. It's a table that's kind of a U-shaped table where all the 12 disciples are there. And the one closest to Jesus, the one to the left, is the people that are most honored. So to the right of Jesus is John. We know John? John is like the beloved. The, the, the one who is always there for Jesus. The one that Jesus loved the most, the Bible says. And then to the left of Jesus was Judas. And then the other ones. Judas is sitting here at a place of honor in the table that he set up for his people. And, and so we see that we see what, what's called in the Bible dramatic irony. Anybody heard about dramatic irony about reading? What's dramatic irony? <coughs> it, it, it's, when, it's when the reader... <laughs> When the writer puts something in for the reader that nobody in the story knows, but the, but the reader knows it before it's happening, right? So we see that Judas is going to betray Jesus. When do we know that Judas, Judas is going to betray Jesus? At what point in the biblical story do we know that Judas will betray Jesus? Okay, that's the, the garden of Gethsemane when he keys the cheek. What do you say? At the very start of the Gospels. In the Gospels, you see Matthew, Mark, Luke. You, you see Thaddeus. You see Bartholomew. And then when they introduce Judas, which is always last, what is at the end of that sentence? Judas, the one who will betray Jesus. We know from the very beginning of the story that Judas is going to betray Jesus. Nobody but Jesus and you who are reading the story know about this. The disciples don't know what's going on. The disciples don't know that, in, that on Wednesday, he went to the high council and they paid him 30 pieces of silver to betray him, to go arrest him, to tell them where he's at on that night on Thursday so they can go arrest him and get him. The disciples don't know that. We know that. The disciples don't know that. The host of this table, the host of this party, who is it? Jesus. Who told everybody to go? Who told the disciples to go and get the, 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 the upper room together? That was Jesus. So the host invites everybody. And that's what we have to learn as lesson one today. The host of the table invites everybody. The invitation to drink the cup and to break the bread, to be a part of this group, is for everybody, including those who betray Jesus. Have you or I betrayed Jesus at any point in time? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. We all have betrayed. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. We've all fallen short. We've all betrayed him in one way, shape, or form. It's easy to get into the mindset of, well, there's big sins. I don't, I don't steal. I don't rob. I don't murder. I'm a good person, right? There's large sins. There's medium sins. What are medium sins? There are small sins. What are small sins, right? You guys know that in the Lord, there is no large, medium, and small. Everything that is sin is sin at the same level. 
So just because Judas is going to betray Jesus in this big way doesn't make him any worse than you or I. You or I have betrayed Jesus in a similar fashion with our actions, with our words, even with our thoughts. Our thoughts also matter. But how many can praise God that regardless of our faults, Jesus invites us anyway. Amen. Jesus invites us anyway to have communion with him, to share in a relationship with him, to share in bread and cup with his community. I praise God for that. That regardless of my sin, of what I'm thinking, Jesus still invites me to be a part of him and his community. I praise God for that. The one who will betray me, it says. And what does everybody start to do when he says, one of you will betray me? What, does everybody, what did everybody start to do at that point? Is it me? Is it me? It wasn't pointing at, is it you? It was, is it me? Is it, is it me? Eleven times, is it me? 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 They were getting nervous. Because they knew that at some point, Peter's like, I know I lost my temper at times. I know I have I've, I've whipped out my blade at times with people. I know, but I thought, Thomas, I've doubted Jesus so many times. You can just imagine the thoughts that run through these. I lied. I, I might have stolen a little money here and there. You know, the thoughts that run through the disciples' minds. Is it me? Is it me? Is it me? The table, the invitation should trigger in us an examination of our hearts. We got to examine our hearts. How are we walking with God? How is our walk with God? We got to examine ourselves. We got to take a step back and say, is it me? What did I do? How did I wrong you? How can I restore my relationship with you, Jesus? We got to examine ourselves. Part of the manners that we have to have at this table is we have to come examining ourselves, understanding where we're at in our walk with God, understanding that God invites us to get closer and closer. That he wants to lean on you even. So we read that Jesus sat at a table. But the original language actually is more like he was leaning on the table. He didn't have right table manners, right? They all reclined on the table. Because they were all in, a, in a, what's called a triclinium. Everybody say triclinium. Triclinium. That, you guys know that's a Greek word. Anyways, <coughs> so the table is similar to this. Right? It's similar to this shape, like that, like that, and like this. And then the disciples would sit on the side. They wouldn't sit on a chair. They would sit on the floor and, re and recline on uh, li like a, uh, one of these pillows, but a big one, right? And they would recline on the left-hand side usually, leaving the right hand to go and pick at stuff. Who was at his left? <laughs> Judas. How was he reclining? He leans on you. Jesus wants that intimacy with you. He wants to be with you so close, despite the fact that Judas was going to betray him. Jesus was being intimate with Judas. He was there leaning on him. Having meals together, eating together. That's the kind of relationship that Jesus wants to have with you. And despite that, he invited him anyways. He said, we read, <coughs> the one who will betray me will put his hand in the bowl. You guys remember that part of the reading? The one who will betray me will put his hand in the bowl. Who put his hand in the bowl? If it's a communal bowl, and everybody is, who put their hand in their bowl? 
You guys ever, any Dominicans or Puerto Ricans that have Sancocho? Yeah, you guys know what Sancocho is? Like a big stew, a big pot? Is it one big pot? And then everybody with the ladle goes at any time, and you're trying to fight for the, the meat part, right? <coughs> Who puts the ladle in the bowl? Their hand in the bowl, everybody. So who's gonna betray him? Everybody's thinking, it's me. I just put my hand in it. I just put my hand in it. Thank God that Jesus does not expose our sin to the world. Can you guys thank God for that? That Jesus does not expose the sin that you do. He doesn't expose it to the world. Did Judas say, uh, did Jesus say, Judas is going to betray me? What did he say? One of you will betray me. One of you will betray me. He didn't oust Judas. He didn't put his business out there. Despite what he was going to do, the severity that he was going to do, he didn't do that. Hmm? Think about what Peter did shortly after. Imagine what the rest of them might have done if they went from Judas is going to betray him. Yeah. Peter had the blade on him yeah. in the upper room. If he would have found out, somebody, somebody would have been chopped off. Some, yeah, exactly. I agree with you there. Thank God that Jesus does not expose our sin to the world. He did not expose it there to him. How did Judas get ousted? How do we know, how do the disciples kind of know that it was Judas? Lord, is it me? Lord, is it me? Lord, is it me? Judas says, Master, Rabbi, is it me? What did Jesus say? You said it, not me. You said it. You said you were going to betray me, not me. Right? And, and, and in that, we see what Judas was thinking about, how Jesus was thinking about Jesus in that moment. Because all the disciples says, Lord, is it me? 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 Judas comes. What did he say? Master, rabbi, is it me? Teacher, is it me? Jesus is a teacher, amen? But is he more than a teacher? We see there that Jesus was not Lord to Judas. He was just a teacher. So, table manners for you. Who is Jesus to you? Is he just a good person? A good historical figure? Is he a teacher that teaches you good things? He's all of those things. But if he is not Lord of your life, if he is not Lord of your life, King of kings to you, it doesn't matter. It doesn't mean things to you. Jesus has to be Lord of your life. Jesus has to be the Savior of your soul, the King of kings, Lord of hosts. Jesus has to be all of those things to you as you come to the table next week. Make sure that Jesus is all of those things to you. Not just teacher, but Lord of your heart. Lord of your life. That is what Jesus needs to be to you. So, as you come to the table, it should trigger in you, you to examine yourself. Examine your walk with Jesus. Examine who Jesus is to you. Examine all of those things. In 2 Corinthians 13, it says, Examine yourself to see if your faith is genuine. <coughs> Test yourselves. Examine yourselves to see if your faith is genuine. Paul calls us to always look introspectively at our hearts, making sure that we're looking inward so that we're walking right with God at all times. Jesus, the gracious hope, does not expose our sin. However, sooner or later, things will come to light, as we saw with Judas. Sooner or later, things will come to light. 
So make sure that you get ahead of it. Make sure that you expose yourself to Jesus. Make sure that you come to Jesus and what's called confess to Jesus. Whatever it is that is drawing you down, whatever it is that you're doing that you're not supposed to be, whatever it is as you're examining yourself that you know is not right with God, confess it to Jesus. When we sin, when we, when, when we do what's not the right thing in God's eyes, what do we feel? Guilt. Guilt. Shame. What else? Embarrassment. Loss. And, 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 and then we feel... So are we going to do it again? Sometimes, right? But at the moment, we think, no, we're not going to do it again. That's called regret. We read, and you can read this in John 13, another view of the Lord's Supper. In John's account of what happened that night, it says that when Judas took the bread and he ate the bread, that's when he realized that Jesus knew what happened. That's when he realized that Jesus knew what was going down. Uh, and Jesus says, go do what you're going to do. Go do what you're going to do and do it quickly. And Judas then leaves the table and goes back to the people that paid him 30 pieces of silver. Did anybody know what happens at that point of, this, of the story? Did he get more money for it? He threw it back to them. I don't want this anymore. I just hurt my best. I don't want this anymore. He threw the money back. People didn't accept the money back. So he had to take the money with him. So he left the table with regret, it says. How many regret the things that you do sometimes? We regret what we do. But don't leave it at regret. Don't just leave it at regret. Let regret lead to confession. Lord, I'm sorry. Lord, I don't want to do this again. Help me with this. And let confession then turn to repentance. You guys know what repentance is? When you turn away from what you just did and do the opposite. Make sure the regret turns to confession. Confession to repentance and repentance to transformation. Make sure that that transforms you into a new person. And then that transformation then turns to consecration. Meaning, I want to be holy for you. I want to be set apart for you. I don't want to do this and do it the way the world does it. I want to do it the way you do it, Jesus. The way you teach me is how I want to lead, lead, uh, lead my life and live my life. Not how I've been taught, how you teach me. That's how we should be as we come to the Lord's table. As we come next week to the Lord's table. And then we see that the Lord says something very peculiar. He says, I will not drink of this vine again until the time of my father's kingdom. He's not going to actually drink wine again until the time of my father's kingdom. This table is an invitation to an even greater banquet that we will have when the Lord returns. This table is an invitation to a greater banquet that we're going to have. It's a, it's a wedding banquet. The, the Bible talks about it in Revelation 19.9. It says, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. What we do month in and month out as we commemorate the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus is an invitation to that greater banquet that we're going to have. That should give us hope. That no matter what we're going through in life, it should give us hope of a future. A hope that this is nothing in comparison to what will be. And it should reduce the burden. It should minimize the impact of whatever it is you're going because you understand that you're part of something bigger. And in comparison, in comparison, there is no comparison to whatever you're going through with 
that future glory that we'll be a part of. So nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Jesus Christ. And it's hard because the Christian life, life in general, but the Christian life is a bittersweet life. You guys know that sweet and sour sauce they serve in Chinese restaurants and everywhere? Life is like a sweet and sour sauce for Christians. Life is like that because we have incredibly sour and bitter moments, don't we? Matter of fact, Jesus promises that we will. <laughs> he, in this world, you will have hardship and trouble. That's what Jesus says. That's for Christians. So the, 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 the promise is that you won't go through things. The promise is the sweet part of the sour. That you will have joy even in your trials and tribulations. That you will have peace and peace joy and all of these fruit of the spirit that God can infuse in you if you let him in those difficult times. That's the hope that we have. So life is bittersweet. Jesus in this moment is going through one of the worst moments that anybody in, and I would argue with anybody that this is the most horrible moment of a human being's life that Jesus just experienced. Not only is he going to go to trial and to be whipped and to be bloodied and bruised for you and me and hung in a cross for nine hours and go through all of that for you and me. Not only is he going to do that, but his best friend just betrayed him the night before. Right? So all of these things Jesus is going through. And yet, what do we read was the last thing that they did in that meal. Anybody read it? Anybody have it? What is the last thing they did? I mean, you almost have it there. Verse 30. They sang hymns and psalms and went out to the Mount of Olives. Can you imagine the worship leader, Jesus Christ, singing? Jesus singing, even when he is going through these things, he knows he's going through. It says that in the Mount of Olives, in, in the Garden of Gethsemane, moments later, <coughs> when he's stressed out, he's, he's sweating blood. <laughs> blood, sweat, and tears in that moment because he was so stressed. And yet, we see Jesus lifting his voice to his Father in praise and in worship. That I think that's like the most genuine worship, and mm. just the best gift and offering you can give to Jesus. Because I know, for example, even like you, like when you've gone through difficult situations, like right before or the next before you had to preach, and I've offered to step in for you, and you're like, no, I gotta do this, and it's been one of like the most profound heartfelt messages, right? And um and I know for a fact that I've had like Naomi right there when they've led worship and they're going through it and it's like one of the most beautiful worship that we've ever given. I think Naomi can hardly stand up sometimes because of her medical condition and like her foot. And like she's there in worship and it's like the most sincere worship that um, a lot of us, like, you know, somebody in our in our inner circle is hurting, or our family is hurting, and we still come here just to connect with God. And there's something special about worshiping God in the storm, worshiping God when you have, like, nothing to give, and just seeking Him to, like, you got to plug in. <coughs> Amen. When there's nothing else to give because you're depleted, your emotions, your heart, your, your feelings, all of these things, your mind is consumed by what you're going through. When you have nothing to give, you give it to God. When you have nothing else to give, surrender. Open your mouth and praise and worship. Jesus, we see a picture of him singing. The Lord God likes to receive praise and worship through song. If not, Jesus wouldn't have done it, right? 
praise and worship your God in those moments that you just can't lift up your eyes and your mouths and your heart to the one who can. When you can't, lift your voice to the one who can. That is how we fight our battles. That is how we fight our battles. We don't fight it with, 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 with swords. We don't fight it with our own strength. We fight it in surrender to the God who can, to the God who will win our battles for us. But we got to surrender. So those are the table matters. The host invites everybody. The invitation is for everybody. Those who will betray him, those who have betrayed him, the invitation is for everybody. The host, bless you, the host of the table, understand that he is Lord, that Jesus is Lord, not just a teacher, not just a good person, that you're coming to the creator of the universe, the one who formed you in your mother's womb. That is who you're getting close to, your savior, as you're coming to the table. And that when you come to the table, understand that it's an invitation back. It's an invitation back to the banquet that we will have. And that when you're going through difficult times, lift your voices in praise. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We understand that you want us to commune with you. You want us to give thanks to you. That you call us to be in community together and that you call us to eat bread and, and drink cup together, Father God, to commemorate, to remember you in these moments. And that in doing so, we receive grace. And in that moment, we understand that you are with us and we can get closer to you in those moments. Father, prepare our hearts as we leave this place today. Prepare our hearts this week. May anything, as we're examining ourselves, that anything that doesn't belong there, that doesn't belong to you, help us to root it out. And it's not in our own strength. Father God, we ask for your strength. We ask for your Holy Spirit to help us root out all of those things in us that do not belong and replace those things with the things of you, with your Holy Spirit. Fill us, Lord. Fill us with your, with your love, peace, and hope, with your Holy Spirit. Father God, we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you guys.